Welcome. Welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. We're delighted you're with us today. I'm Don Williams, president of City Club. Our speaker today is Michael Schellenberger. He is the author of Breakthrough, From the Death of Environmentalism to the Politics of Possibility. For the benefit of our radio and television audiences, please turn off your cell phones, Blackberries, and other electronic devices. First, a few announcements. Join us next Friday when Willamette Week editor Mark Zussman will be joined by this year's recipients of the Skidmore Awards. Now, these awards are given to exceptional leaders under 35 who work in the nonprofit sector. Zussman will interview the recipients on both the obstacles and challenges facing this generation's group of young profit leaders. And the ceremony will begin at 11.45, and then we'll start our regular Friday forum at uh, 12.15. I continue to be amazed at the energy and creativity of our City Club New Leader Council, and I'm going to give you two examples why. Tomorrow at 9.30, you're invited to go on a two-hour walk at Mount Talbert Nature Park with Metro Council President David Bragdon and other elected officials. Mount Talbert opened on October 6th and is our region's newest regional park. And a Metro Park Ranger will explain, explain efforts to both preserve and protect the region's natural areas. The hike is free and so are the refreshments. Space is limited and if you want to go on that you should contact Kim at the City Club office this afternoon. And if you don't like to hike, the New Leaders Council invites you to a screening and discussion of the movie King Corn at the Hollywood Theater on Wednesday, November 14th. And this movie follows two college friends who moved to Iowa to learn where their food comes from. And after the showing, filmmaker Kurt Ellis will discuss the federal farm bill and other consumer-related issues. The film starts at 7, and admission at the door is $6. No RSVP is necessary. Healthcare reform is a hot issue, and we're having a program. Uh, Reese Sailors and the governor's staff, City Club member, Adam, board member Adam Davis, and consultant Len Bergstein will discuss the outcome of Measure 50 on healthcare policy. They'll also talk about what the outlook is for policy reform on the state and national agenda in 2008. These people are dynamic speakers. And the discussion will begin on Thursday, November 15th at the City Club Commons. It'll go from 6.30 to, or I'm sorry, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Come early and get a bite to eat or a cup of coffee at Cafe Walla. Please remember to turn your ballot for the November 6th election if you haven't done so. And if you're interested in any of our ballot measure reports, you can access those at the City Club website. Today, I'd like to welcome students we have from Portland Community College. They're taking a, a class that focuses on democracy and action. And could we have them stand up? They're in the back of the room. <laughs> Along with attending the City Club Friday Forum, each is going to attend a community council or board meeting. And they're not only going to learn how to get things done in the civic arena, but see the importance of clearly articulating their ideas and questions. And remember that when you're asking a question after the program that they're going to use you as an example. We're fortunate today to have terrific corporate sponsors for this program. And this quarter's sponsors are Gerding Edlin Development and the law firm of Baron Liebman LLP. Thank you for your support. The City Club typically doesn't have a speaker with the descriptions given to Michael Schellenberger. In a number of the 69,800 Google hits I got for him, our speaker has been labeled a bad boy environmentalist, an angry heretic on the run, a pariah, and even an infidel. And I might add that last charge was brought by his fellow environmentalists. No, he's, he's not a politician. However, maybe he contributes to that image by statements such as, 
cold white wine is so good with fried fatty food. The controversy started in 2004 when Mr. Schellenberger and his co-authors triggered a firestorm with their essay, The Death of Environmentalism. They argued that the politics dealing with acid rain and smog cannot adequately address global warming. Society has changed, but politics just hasn't kept up. Environmentalism must die, they concluded, so that something new can be born. Albert Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting a different result. Our speaker asserts that environmental strategies haven't worked well in the past and will not work any better in the future. We've seen 20 years of failure trying to solve global warming. Why is that? It's because the issue is viewed as the environmentalists versus the corporations. Mr. Schellenberg states, it's never been so simple. None of it's going to add up to anything sufficient to deal with the energy crisis and the crisis of global warming. Michael Schellenberger is the managing director of Amer American Environics, and that's a social research and political strategy firm. He also co-founded the Breakthrough Instit Institute, and it's described as a small think tank with big ideas. He works on everything and writes on everything about energy to technology and innovation to changing social values. Michael was raised in Greeley, Colorado. He graduated from Earlham University in Indiana and earned his master's degree in cultural anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. Wired Magazine raves, green groups make carp, but this book could turn out to be the best thing to happen to environmentalists since Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. If we can't remember the past, are we condemned to repeat it? Michael Schellenberger tells us today how we can be part of the problem, part of the solution, not just part of the problem. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Don. And the truth is, I am going to tell you how you can be part of the problem. Um, and uh, thanks very much to the City Club for inviting me, and also to Larry Wallach, who is on the Breakthrough Institute's advisory board and has been a real um, uh, champion of uh, these ideas, even when they were, or maybe even especially when they were unpopular. Um, I actually got my start in politics in 1996 when I left graduate school to start sort of an activist uh, public relations firm. And we one of the first things that we worked on was a campaign to save the last ancient redwoods of California, redwoods that I have fallen in love with and spend a lot of time on in, uh, during my vacations. And then the second campaign was actually a campaign to pressure Nike, uh, your hometown company, to uh, do better by its workers in China. And we organized young women and feminist groups to criticize Nike for extolling uh, female empowerment in its advertising and uh, uh, keeping women down in its factories. Then around the, the, the turn of the century, around 1999, I became very concerned about global warming. And I sought out clients to hire us to publicize the issue. And I didn't know that much about it, but I, was, I found myself working for one of the big national environmental groups, publicizing what in the industry we call sort of a classic disaster report. Uh, it's a report about how global warming in California would lead to droughts, water shortages, the collapse of agriculture, death, destruction, just all the stuff that local TV news loves. And I was on the phone with the senior scientist, and I asked him, I said, you know, I don't really understand this that well. Can you, I mean, is it true that if we try to do something about this, that it's going to destroy the economy? And he said, you know, it's not true. He said, you know, if we do this right, uh, we're going to have a lot of technological innovation in the clean energy markets of the future. And it will drive economic growth rather than restrict it. And it has the potential to create millions of new jobs, scientists, engineers, people installing solar panels. Um, it could, you know, it'll reduce our dependence on foreign oil, which is a major threat to our national security. 
Um, and you know, energy is a special case because energy touches everything else in the economy. And so it has sort of a multiplier impact in terms of prosperity. So every time you go from whale, you go from whale oil to petroleum, or from dung and wood to coal, or from coal to natural gas, it has a net benefit in terms of economic development. And I remember just sort of pausing for a moment and kind of thinking about this. And then I asked him, well, why don't we ever talk about that? Why is it just avoiding apocalypse? Why don't we have a politics about creating this clean energy future? And I, was, I remember being unsatisfied by the answer he gave me. He said, well, we have to talk about global warming because we have to talk about global warming. Um, it's a huge threat. People have to understand the threat. And that's how we'll mobilize action. And it was around then that I started talking to my uh, friend and co-author, Ted Nordhaus, who was having similar arguments with his clients. He was telling them that they should just stop arguing with global warming deniers. He said, you know, every time you have that argument, you just elevate the sense among the public that there's a debate here. Why don't we just, we just need to create a politics that moves on to a fight over the solutions, which don't require that you care about global warming at all. And we, uh, a year later, it turns out, the philanthropist and media mogul, Ted Turner, who is a very well-known environmental funder as well as uh, the founder of CNN, he commissioned a series of very intensive focus groups with the public, with just your regular voters. He hired some very good cognitive scientists, social scientists who specialize in understanding how do we reason about the world, how do people think about the world, what sort of shortcuts do they use to make sense of things. And they would show them, this was of course, you know, six years before An Inconvenient Truth, they would show them uh, little video clips of sort of nightly news broadcasts of the kind that I had sort of helped to create about all the disasters that would come with global warming. So, you know, hurricanes, droughts, famine, resource wars. And then they would interview the people after they had seen this and they'd say, you know, what, you know what's your reaction? And people would say things like, boy, you know, it makes me think I'm going to need a bigger SUV to survive all the coming hurricanes. Um, and, and, uh, and, and people would uh, think about what could they do to protect their own families. They would become smaller, not larger. They would become more survivalist, not more community-oriented. And a, a few years later, or actually two years later, I saw a NASA scientist give a very compelling presentation about global warming. By this point, um, I had become sort of a, you know, in the industry now, there, some people have coined all of this, these disaster scenarios, kind of climate porn, you know? Um, and there, I sort of had become kind of a climate kind of porn guy, you know? And I was sort of devouring all the information about all of these apocalyptic scenarios. And I, I had heard this, I saw this NASA scientist present what I, th I still think is the most compelling presentation on the science, where he put a map up of the globe, and it reminded me of War Games. Do you ever see that movie? And, you know, at the end of it, there's the missiles firing. You can sort of see the missiles firing at each other, a computer simulation. And he simulated droughts, water shortages, and famines in kind of glowing red light on the map. And um, I was terrified by this. And I, I, I was in New York. I saw it in New York. I flew back to California. I, uh, my flight was late, so I, got into, I climbed into bed at like 2 a.m. My wife is asleep. Um, you know, all, the good husband, I kind of woke her up, and I proceeded to explain to her in a, in a great bit of detail, what I had just seen. And um, she was like, you know, her, she, I think she said one thing. She said, you need to shut up. You're scaring the hell out of me. Um, and then, of course, we proceeded to, to stay up the rest of the night. And the next day, she said to me, she said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, what you told me. And I'm thinking that we should consider buying some land in the country that has water on it. Um, because that way we can survive you know, when the civilization starts to really collapse. And I said, you know, babe, I don't think that's going to do it because the military dictatorship will just take over the land. Um, and I would just sort of watch myself and watch how we sort of talked about it. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm becoming like one of those people in those focus groups. I'm not becoming larger. Um, I'm becoming smaller. And so we started something in 2000. I quit 
my public relations work, I said I really want to get more in depth into these issues. And so with a group of other people, we co-founded something called the Apollo Alliance. We called it the New Apollo Project. The idea was um, a big project. You know, you put a man on the moon, you bring him back safely to Earth. That was an inspiring vision. We now need to put ourselves up to a big challenge, accelerate the transition to a clean energy economy, $30 billion a year to get off oil. And we had this great idea, and it was sort of like we kind of brought it to all of our friends in the environmental movement you know, in Washington and, and to the labor unions. And everybody said, oh, this is, this is a lovely idea, and they all sort of endorsed it. And then we'd sort of we'll go, let's, let's go push this in Congress. And nobody was interested in doing that. And in fact, uh, the, uh, not due to us, but uh, on his own, Congressman Jay Inslee, he's a congressman from the Seattle area, he had introduced legislation for a new Apollo project. And it had made the environmental community very nervous. They said, well, this is going to be confused with what the Bush administration wants to do in their energy bill, because they talk about technology too. So we, they asked Ted and me to, to ask Congressman Inslee to withdraw the legislation. And we were still good soldiers, and so we did that. And, um, and the idea was, well, we'll let, you know, we'll get that out of the way, and then we can kind of turn to it later in a different context. Well, of course, there was never any intention to move the Apollo legislation. And in 2004, we lobbied the Kerry campaign very hard. I actually hired a group of young activists to go to Iowa. Um, Matt Ewing, who's now at Move On, led this incredible charge of young people. They would dress up in space, shoots, space suits and they would wear, they would hold a big Apollo signs. And John Kerry saw them. This is, of course, before he won the nomination. And we have it on film. And he got so excited by it, he actually goes, there's a scene where he goes, and I see the new Apollo project people in the crowd. This is about freeing America from our dependence on oil. This is about creating millions of new jobs. We, it's not gonna be easy, but we can do it. This is gonna be you know, the next great challenge. And it was like in that moment, it was like John Kerry was a different person. It was like a John Kerry that you could kind of imagine being president of the United States. And then he proceeded to win the nomination and he sort of fell back onto the old environmental interest group agenda, which consisted of higher fuel economy standards and a cap on greenhouse gases. And we lobbied them very hard. We even hired his pollster in an attempt to influence Kerry. And uh, I know it's a really sometimes ugly game. Um, and None of it worked. We, they insisted to us that, no, they had a solid, you know, we had, our, we had four boxes, they told us, the economy, energy independence, foreign policy, and health care. And they have their energy independence thing, and that's higher fuel economy standards and caps on greenhouse gas emissions. And we said, well, yeah, but, you know, Apollo's different than that. Apollo is a story about America's moral purpose, about our identity as a country of dreamers and inventors. And it affects all of the things you mentioned, economic development, foreign policy, so we're not invading countries to get their oil, um, you know, health care, uh, national health care system so that people feel the security they need to, add, to go and be the entrepreneurs that we need, and of course, um, energy independence. And they said, well, yeah, but we've got our four boxes. And so we decided to write The Death of Environmentalism. Um, we felt like there was really... Uh, we, we could sort of see where this was going, which was it was going to be the same agenda year after year, the same stump speeches, unless somebody uh, uh, made an intervention. So we wrote the, we interviewed all of the big national environmental leaders, the guys that determine environmental policy in Washington on global warming in particular. And by the time we were done, we knew that there was something profoundly wrong with the approach of dealing with this huge challenge. We interviewed a very high-ranking senior environmental policy leader who told us, we said, what if, you know, it was, what if like to try to get higher fuel economy standards for cars, we tried to deal with the healthcare challenge that Detroit faces. You know, Japanese and European automakers, they have national health care covered by their countries. We don't have a health care system that puts our firms at a disadvantage. Doesn't excuse the automakers. They've obviously failed to innovate. But maybe you could make a deal where we could cover the health care through a kind of new industrial policy, you know, around health care and higher fuel economy standards. And he said to us, he said, you know, look, we're an environmental group. 
My job is to, is, to be, is to represent the environment. I can't go doing a new industrial policy. I can't go representing the labor unions. That's not what I do. And it was at that moment it was like, wow, you know, that epitomized for us. If that was environmentalism, then it needed to die. And that was the argument that we made in the essay. We didn't say it was dead. We said it needed to die so that something new could be born, something that didn't sit in these issue silos any longer. And the most quoted part of that essay was a line that we wrote which just said, all of the gloom and doom, we said, you know, Martin Luther King didn't give an I have a nightmare speech. <laughs> and it got picked up and, you know, it you know, led to a bunch of people kind of, it was a nice sort of sound bite and it led to, there's even a book out now in, in Canada that was inspired by it. And, you know, when we were sort of looking to write this book after all the attention of it, we decided after we finished writing it that we wanted to kind of come back to Martin Luther King's dream speech. And I didn't know that much about it. I had read um, a very good history of the civil rights movement called Parting the Waters uh, about 10 years ago. And I, I pulled it off my shelf again. And I just started to read about the dream speech and I listened to a bunch of very good NPR um, stories about it. And what we learned is that King actually did give an I Have a Nightmare speech. And he, in fact, he gave it just before he gave the dream speech. And the context was that civil rights leaders, King and Bayard Rustin, were organizing the March on Washington, Philip Randolph, and they were trying to push for civil rights legislation to get passed federally. And, and Kennedy, President Kennedy at the time, calls up King and he says, he says, uh, you know, Martin, uh, I need you to call the march off. You know, well, you're going to alienate Southern conservative Democrats, and we need success in the Capitol, not just a big show. And Kennedy then proceeded to fly to Berlin, where he called for freedom for people living behind the Iron Curtain. And that uh, didn't sit well with Dr. King. And he uh, came into that very famous march on Washington, and Lincoln's at his back, and Congress is before him, and he was in a very dark mood. And he had been traveling around the country with his friend, the great gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, um, who, uh, thanked, thanks to YouTube, you can still you can see her perform on YouTube, and you can also see the I Have a Dream speech on YouTube. And she had heard King giving riffs of the I Have a Dream speech in various locations around the country, and they were both kind of tired, and it was an extremely hot day. It was August in Washington, D.C., and King says to Mahalia, he says, I want you to sing I've Been Buked and I've Been Scorned. It's a very dark um, song. And Mahalia's manager, who was standing there at the time, said, he said, you're going to need to sing something a little bit more uplifting than that. And, uh, but King was like, that's the song I want. And Mahalia said, if that's what Martin wants, I'm going to sing it. So she sang this very dark song. And then King gets up and proceeds to give by far the darkest speech of his career. It was a speech about the frustrations he had, about um, all of the darkness in the South at the time, the beatings, the injustice. He talked about the debt that white America owed black America, and he really threatened chaos if uh, civil rights legislation wouldn't pass. And Mahalia is a great performer. She's sitting like 20 feet behind him on the dais, and she sort of senses that he's trying to lose his audience. And so at this very critical moment in the speech, like maybe the darkest moment, she just yells out from the back of the dais. She just yells, tell him about the dream, Martin, like that. And, uh, and if you kind of, King's a smooth guy, so you can barely notice it on the, uh, on the, on the video footage. And he kind of pauses and patters a bit, and then she just yells it again. Tell him about the dream, like that. And uh, King kind of catches himself, and he, he says to himself really more than to anybody else, he says, but we should not wallow in the valley of despair. And at that moment, he starts to give the dream speech, and it's really just one of the most remarkable uh, bits of uh, political oratory, I think, of all times, um, and certainly the greatest uh, uh, speech that King gave. And we tell that story at the beginning of the book because we want to say that to create a positive politics, 
is not the same as pretending like everything's okay. In fact, King's speech would not have been as dramatic as it was had he not taken people to a very dark place. The mountaintop is never as high as it is when, once you've been to the dark valley. And that a new politics can't be rooted in fear, but it has to acknowledge it. And it has to recognize the awful, awful war that we're in right now in Iraq. And it has to acknowledge that every time we put gasoline in our cars, we fund Al Qaeda. And it has to acknowledge that we are slipping behind in our terms of our economic competitiveness with Europe, especially in these fast growing new energy markets. But that you can't leave people there. What happens when you leave people in a state of fear? They become smaller, not larger. They start thinking about water, places with water in the countryside, or, uh, or moving to other countries, or they start thinking about what they'll do when things really start to collapse. And in fact, it's interesting to watch what Dick Cheney does, what he did before the 2004 elections. He said to Americans, he said, you need to be really afraid. He said terrorists could attack at any moment. You, there's good reasons to be scared. And he's doing the same thing now on Iran. Crazy man in Iran is about to get a nuclear weapon, they say. And this should scare you. And that's it. They leave people in the dark valley to remain small and afraid. And we have a huge body of social science research that shows that when you leave people in that state of fear, they become less likely to change, not more likely to change. They become less empathic, not more empathic. They become more zero-sum, view win, I lose, less generous. And we'll often lay this research out in very long presentations for some of our colleagues in the environmental movement, and then invariably there will be somebody in the back that will raise their hand and, and they'll, they'll ask a question, they'll say, but you know, but fear seems to work really well for the right wing. And we'll say, that's right, it works really well for the right wing. Um, so we need to create a politics that acknowledges the darkness and in fact, I think even dramatizes it, emphasizes it, explains it in some great detail, and then helps people to imagine a future that is even bigger and brighter and more positive. Now, there's a problem with the way that we talk about global warming right now. There's two ways that you hear, the two discourses that you hear from the environmental movement. The one is that global warming is going to be like apocalypse. It's, you know, floods, fires, famines, disease, and it'll be really easy to fix. Here's this fluorescent light bulb and some pollution limits and you'll be set. And then the reaction from the public is, well, you've either just lied about how big this problem is or you've lied about the solution. And they're right. People know intuitively that big problems require big solutions. The other argument is it's a really big crisis and we're not going to be able to live like this anymore. That was the inconvenient truth in Al Gore's film. The inconvenient truth was not that global warming existed nor that it was human caused. Al Gore's message was you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to do without. And we argue in our book that there is a very different story, a more accurate story, and a more accurate prescription. And that is that this is a huge crisis. And it's not just global warming. It's our addiction to oil. It's our lagging economic competitiveness. And it's the threat of uh, widening inequality and poverty globally. And that we faced really big challenges like this in the past. And, uh, you know, there were moments there when, you know, England is being threatened by Nazi Germany, and Churchill gets up and he doesn't say, gosh, we're going to do our best to resist the Nazis, or I hope everybody can pitch in, or voluntary actions ought to be enough. He says, we're going to defend the island no matter what it costs. And that's the attitude, that's the posture that we need to have in the face of this crisis. We have got to have a politics that people are willing to die for, that they are willing to struggle for and risk everything for. If we don't have that, we will fail. And the older remedies that used to work pretty well on older pollution problems are not up for the task. I mean, smog in Los Angeles, we did a really good job dealing with smog in Los Angeles. Inexpensive catalytic converters on tailpipes. We got lead out of gasoline. 
huge impacts. Acid rain was the same way. Scrubbers on smokestacks, a small number of smokestacks. Scrubbers, catalytic converters, those things were really inexpensive and they actually existed before uh, those laws went into place. What led people to create Kyoto was their excitement about how successful the campaign to phase out ozone depleting chemicals had been. But the truth is that the, the alternatives, the alternative chemicals already existed and the Montreal Protocol which phased out the ozone depleting chemicals would never have happened had those chemicals not already been there. And so if in the older pollution problems of the past required a politics of limits and if it did a fairly good job, it's not up to the task of global warming. And that's because what global warming requires is that we move away from coal and oil entirely. And that even as we transition out of coal, that we adopt fairly radical technologies to capture the pollution from coal-fired power plants. Technologies that are expensive, not cheap. And that what's required is not a politics of limits, but a politics of possibility. A politics that's focused on investment and innovation. The models of which don't come from pollution regulation, they come from technology innovation. So there's a forgotten history in the United States about this. It's not acid rain and smog. It's how out of the Civil War, when our country was just a mess, we created the railroads, which unleashed a riot of prosperity that we all still benefit from. In the 1950s, uh, uh, we justified the interstate highway system as a national security need. And in one of our favorite examples, the Defense Department literally guaranteed the market for microchips. They knew they needed computers, they knew they needed microchips, but there was a problem. Microchips cost $1,000 a chip, and they needed them cheap. So how do you make things cheap? You make a lot of them, and it works the same on all technologies almost. So they literally guaranteed the market for microchips, they bought down the price, so microchips went from being $1,000 a microchip to $20 a microchip in about five years. Wouldn't have happened had the federal government not made a big investment. The internet was literally invented in a Defense Department laboratory. These are the models of how we get from here to there. We chose the Apollo metaphor because Kennedy gets up and he says, we're gonna put a man on the moon and we're gonna bring him back safely to Earth. We're gonna do it by the end of the decade and it's gonna be hard, not easy. It's gonna be expensive, not cheap. And we're going to do it because it's going to test the best of our abilities. And it was one of the most compelling uh, speeches that a political leader has made in the 20th century. It's notable he didn't say, we'll, bring a man, we'll put a man on the moon, and bring him back safely on Earth, and we'll do it really inexpensively. We'll do it out on the cheap. We'll do it with, uh, by, uh, by regulating air travel. You know, we like to joke that, you know, we didn't invent the personal computer by limiting the number of typewriters that people could use every year. You know, we didn't invent the internet by putting a, by levying a fee on telegraphs and faxes. Um, these are things that have to be invented. And in 2002, around the same time that we, it was really the, one of the inspirations for the New Apollo Project was a very good physicist at New York University, he's now retired, his name is Marty Hoffert. I just had the chance to meet him on the book tour. And they wrote an article in Science, and it was written by guys who knew both climate science and the energy sciences. And what they concluded was that global warming is fundamentally an energy problem, and it cannot be regulated away. And there's a reason for this, and I can say more about it because it can get a little technical, but essentially the environmental strategy of regulating pollution is premised on making dirty energy more expensive so that clean energy is more cost competitive. And while that strategy will work fairly well if you, just, if you can get it passed, there's limits to what the public is willing to spend on energy. And in fact, you know, uh, in uh, November of last year, Californian voters, who are some of the most environmentally aware voters in the country, rejected a ballot initiative that would have taxed oil production and used the money for clean energy. This was five months, by the way, after everybody that I knew had thought that out everything had changed, that a tipping point had been reached because of an inconvenient truth. And so you've got a dilemma. If you can't increase the cost of dirty energy high enough for clean energy technologies like solar to be cost competitive, then those clean energy technologies are not going to come online in a big way. And we point out that that's sort of a Gordian knot. 
and that the way you solve a Gordian knot is to stop trying to untie it. You cut it. And the way you cut it is that you bring the price of clean energy down directly. And the only way to do that is through massive investment. So uh, solar is very similar to microchips. Every time, there's sort of a Moore's law of solar. Every time you double the production of solar panels, the price comes down 20%. And so you can calculate out, what would it cost to bring down the price of solar to natural gas and coal? Well, it would cost somewhere between 50 and $200 billion. It's a lot of money. And it's probably the cheapest $200 billion the US government will have ever spent. We'll spend about 1.5 trillion on the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so we lay this framework out and we kind of go, well, if, if we could put up $300 billion over 10 years and private investors could put up, would put up another $200 billion because private capital follows public investment, you'd have like $500 billion. I think that a good, a, a, a semi-decent president who's a, who can sell this could get the Europeans to do $500 billion. After all, that is how much we spent to help rebuild their, their countries after World War II. They would put on the table another 500 billion. Maybe Japan could put in some money, uh, one or 200 billion. You'd have some serious money then. And look what happens when you have money on the table. Possibilities emerge that wouldn't have emerged before. China's not going to sacrifice their economic development. They're not going to raise their energy costs because of global warming. They've got way too many other things to worry about. They're worried about global warming, but it's a little bit like global warming is for Americans. Sure, it's something we care about, but it's not a high priority. But when you have all that money on the table, and you think about all the jobs and the manufacturing that will go to China, that will go to India, that will be here in, in the United States, in, in our high-tech industries, that will be in Europe, all of a sudden, people stop thinking win-lose, and they start thinking win-win. And in fact, it does have that multiplier impact. You know, there's one factory in China now that produces one quarter of all of the world's solar panels. And that's a testament both to China's incredible manufacturing capacity. I mean, I learned this when I was working on Nike sweatshop issues. There are factories with 100,000 workers in them in China. That's like bigger than my hometown. It's an astonishing capacity to produce. In fact, the expert that we interviewed for our chapter on China in the book, he said, you know, what China really excels at is efficient manufacturing. They're able to crank stuff out for cheap. And you get the cheap labor as sort of an added benefit. So the question is kind of, well, what, what you know, we have 1.01% of our energy comes from solar right now. What if we had 500 of those factories? You know, what if we imagined, what if we actually decided that we were going to do what it took to deal with global warming? rather than constantly calculating what Americans would pay, what they wouldn't pay, and kind of trying to kind of go into this stuff backwards, selling it through apocalypse. And we point out in the book that this agenda is exciting, it's inspirational, it pulls better, we've done a ton of opinion research on it, but it's not enough. And that we also need to create a politics that emerges from our new ways of being in the world. And so we have a strange thing that happens in the middle of our book, which is that we move from a conversation about the environment and global warming to a conversation about society and everything that's changed since the 1960s. And we point out that the conservative movements, evangelical churches, are successful not because people go to church to be political. You know, if you ask my friends in Berkeley, you know, why do conservatives go to evangelical church? They'll tell you, well, because they hate gay people and they hate abortion. Um, and it's not the case. People go to church because they want to be with friends. They want to meet people. They like the chit chat. They like to, it's where people meet their lovers. It's where they meet their future employers and employees. And we point out that there are new mega churches, new evangelical mega churches that have tapped into the desires of a country like ours where people have more than met our basic material needs and are moving on to being concerned about becoming unique individuals in the world, about becoming creative, uh, fulfilled human beings. And that people go to church to experience something that happiness researchers, what they're called positive psychologists, what they call flow, which is that experience of kind of serious concentration that you get while singing or playing basketball or mastering a task where there's an intense level of concentration but not so much to disrupt you, that gives us a lot of uh, satisfaction. And also people go to church to be in service of others. 
And so there's something about well, our task that goes beyond our policy agenda and beyond our rhetoric to actually supporting and creating new ways of being in the world. And we also talk about a new story for human development. We point out that in the environmental literature, starting with Silent Spring all the way to An Inconvenient Truth, the story that gets told is that, well, humans used to live in harmony with nature. You know, we used to live in harmony with our surroundings. In fact, Rachel Carson starts Silent Spring with a, a parable about a farm uh, that lived in uh, harmony with its surroundings, uh, you know, sort of a very bucolic setting, and then suddenly a terrible plague fell upon everyone. And the, the dogs died, uh, the, the children died, and the birds stopped singing. It was a silent spring. That's what that book is about. And we like to point out that, well, in fact, things weren't so harmonious back then. Uh, the earth has been a disruptive, chaotic environment for all of our billions of, all of its billions of years, that um, even the indigenous uh, people that we valorize as harmonious had all sorts of nasty wars and genocides and cannibalisms. Um, and I even think back to my grandfather who worked on a farm in Indiana, was a Mennonite, and his, uh, when he was a baby, um, he, he was the last born into his family because his, his mother had already had, um, I think, seven other children. And, and she, when, after she gave birth to my grandfather, father, she got very sick. And nobody knows what was wrong with her. Some people think it was pneumonia, but nobody knows, really. My aunt tells me that she thinks that she died of exhaustion. Um, and the final, the thing that we learned, the only thing we know about her death is that she used to hold my grandfather in her arms, her, her newborn baby, and would just cry for her final days of her life because she knew she would never get to see her children grow up. And life on the farm was hard, not easy, and it was not harmonious. You know, my grandfather got up every morning at 5 a.m. They could barely take vacations because the neighbors would have to watch the farm and do a double shift for them when they were gone. Um, you know, my aunt, I asked her to write down what life was like for her as a child. And they worked all the time, and people were sick, and there wasn't good medical care. And the idea that somehow we have fallen from that, I mean, I can barely get up before 7 a.m., you know, without serious mental disabilities. Um, and, you know, my son, uh, you know, I, whenever, when he's acting up, I always tell him, I say, well, you know, your grandfather had to get up at 5 a.m. every morning. You know, we have no idea. And so we suggest that rather than telling the story about a fall, we should tell a story about human overcoming. You know, there have been societies that have collapsed, but way more of us have overcome. There's seven billion, almost seven billion human beings on Earth. That's not because we're a failed species. That's because we're incredibly successful. We're incredibly able to invent our way out of crises. And recently I had a chance to meet one of my friends who I was involved with in the campaign against Nike sweatshops, and I saw him again. I said, you know, Dara, tell me how's it going for these workers over there? And he said, you know, it's interesting. He said, you know, obviously Nike still has to do a lot more. They really need to pay their workers more. They can pay their workers more. They can give them better conditions. He said, but you know, you could talk to these young women, and they're mostly young women, who work in the factories, and they, you know, what do they have? They have a dress. They, often they have a cell phone. They have a place to live. They have an address. They have an identity and they can love who they want to love, and they can be in a relationship with people that they couldn't have been, their grandparents couldn't have been in a relationship with. And I thought back to this lovely book by Pearl Buck. Um, what is it called, The Good Earth? How many of you read that book? I mean, do you remember the foot binding sequences in that? And it's sort of like, those young girls are overcoming, and their grandparents are overcoming. And this is a story that we need to remind ourselves of. Because when we tell that story and we kind of look around in this incredible luxury and prosperity that we enjoy and the freedoms that we enjoy, it helps us to feel grateful. And it helps us to feel strong. And that mood and that story is by far more important than any number of policy initiatives that we can present. 
So I'll just end by saying that uh, these are in some ways the best of times and the worst of times. We are in a terrible war in Iraq and we're in an awful situation, but we're also, there's more of us experiencing greater prosperity and freedom than human beings have ever experienced. And that we're strong and not weak and that or, you know, the lifeboat Earth might be small, but there's certainly more than enough room for all seven billion of us to live prosperous, happy, and free lives. Thank you very much. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club members. Please limit your question to 30 seconds and make sure it's a question, not a statement. And our first question today will be asked by today's board host, Larry Wallach, and it's appropriate that Larry ask the first questions because he and Michael know each other from Berkeley. Larry is the Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs at Portland State University. He's also an Emeritus Professor of Public Health at UCAL Berkeley and he's been a member of City Club since 2004. Thank you, and thank you, Michael, for coming up to Portland and sharing your story with us. Uh, Michael, part of the message I get from reading your book and from listening to you is that there's a fundamental break, that somehow we can't get there from here, there possibly being doing something uh, significant about global warming. So if that's the case, can you give us a couple of things that are significant things that will help create the path that allows us ultimately to get there from here? Sure. Well, I mean, I think there's a couple things. I mean, the first is, and you know, that was a kind of complicated bit of stuff that I ran through, and so I think that the most important thing that we can do right now as a country is to get real about this investment that we need to make. You know, maybe it's 30 billion, maybe it's 50 billion a year. We need to spend whatever it takes. And we need to level with the American people that this is not going to be easy or cheap and that this is uh, going to be hard and it's going to take a lot of money. But it's what we need to do to get off oil once and for all. We've been talking about it for 30 years. And it's what we need to do to restart the American economy and overcome global warming. And you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I was sort of despairing when we started this book tour because we have been lobbying the presidential candidates, you know, everything we could, throwing our bodies into elevator doors um, to try to make this point. And, you know, we weren't getting a lot of traction um, but then the first day of our book tour, Barack Obama announced that he would uh, make a, a $150 billion investment in clean energy. And uh, we had lobbied for $300 billion, so he's about halfway there. Um, Hillary Clinton has called for $50 billion, John Edwards $13 billion. I mean, all the tier two candidates, you know, they call for like $500 trillion. I mean, they don't have anything to lose. Um, so, um, I mean, God bless them. Um, they're, they're, they have nothing to lose by being so honest. Um, and, you know, the argument that we had made is that this is good politics. You know, the, everyone, the, it's like politicians don't trust the American people to handle this. Uh, you know, and it's sort of like, it's because there, we have many selves and you can go into a focus group and you can talk to Americans and they'll tell you that they pay too much in taxes and that they think the government's a total failure and they don't want to have anything to do with anybody. And yeah, in that mood, uh, there's not a whole lot that they're going to agree to. And that's why I think it's important to sort of, with that agenda and with that crusade for that big investment, we also just have to change who we are in the world. And that means creating a politics that's more oriented towards gratitude uh, and towards overcoming, you know, rather than, you know, well, we are victims, we are weak, and we are poor. Paul Meyer, member of the club. What calculus do you apply to nuclear energy, and what is your position on it? Well, I mean, at, at, you know, Ted and I basically grew up in the anti-nuclear uh, movements um, and uh, I spent a good a fair number of protests in my childhood at Fort St. Vrain uh, near my hometown. 
But when we went and looked at the research on nuclear and on, on energy economics and energy policy and you know really did a big literature review of all the most important studies we literally could not find anybody who thought that nuclear shouldn't be a part of this um, I mean it's sort of shocking when you read it you keep hoping to find somebody who's got the magic pony that uh, you don't need to uh, use nukes anymore but you know nuclear provides about 20 percent of our energy needs in the United States 80 percent in France the idea that we're going to be able to get from here to 80% emissions reductions by 2050 while also taking 20% of our nukes offline is a little um, unrealistic. You know, the final chapter in our book is called Greatness because we think we have a politics oriented around greatness, but the second to last chapter is called Pragmatism. And dealing with this global warming challenge for me feels like the, one of the big central challenges. Um, nuclear obviously has a huge number of, of problems with it in terms of waste and, and security, um, but I don't think there's any doubt that's going to be a part of it. I will also say, though, that you know the nuclear industry, unlike the solar industry, has not been shy about asking for a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, we've literally, when I'm talking about guaranteeing the market for solar panels, well, we have guaranteed the market for nuclear power. That's sort of how nuclear exists in the first place. You know, by con I think they're asking for 50 billion now. I mean, by contrast, the Solar Industry Association, you know, their big audacious demand is for extending the 2005 Bush tax credits for solar. You know, it's like I can't imagine a more lame demand than that. Um, you know, they grow at 40 percent a year, so they're fine. You know, they're like we're really doing well. They need to grow at 40,000 percent a year, and so I, I'm a little disappointed that you know we, you, you hear big talk about clean energy a lot out of Silicon Valley these days and you hear a lot of enthusiasm but if you really look at the economics of it you know even if you quintuple our renewable energy sources we're still going to remain totally wedded to fossil fuels by 2030 and 2050 so there's no way that we can get from here to there without this massive uh, federal investment. Thank you for coming today my name is Gavin White I'm a city club member and activist on a broad range of issues what opportunities do you see for activists in environmental and social justice movements to build power and create change together? In other words, how can activists get out of our issue silos and realize that the roots of ecological, economic, and social issues are the same? Right. Well, I mean, I think the most important, I mean, a lot of people misread the death of environmentalism. They, they were sort of like, well, okay, so it sounds like what you guys are calling for is sort of like a big coalition of all the interest groups. And we were like, well, no, we're calling for the death of all the interest groups <laughs> um, and, and really starting something new. So I like, I, the reason I keep focusing on an inv investment and innovation agenda is that when you have an investment agenda or a development, you know, that a good development, and you've had a number of great developments here in Portland, it's, it gives you something very concrete to kind of think about and work on on a triple bottom line perspective. How do we make sure that this is good for business? Because if it's not good for business, it's not going to work. How do you make sure it's good for uh, the work that we need to do in terms of climate change, reducing oil dependency? And how do you make it work for people? And so my experience is that those conversations about bringing together a broader progressive coalition never work well in the abstract. They work very well in the concrete. Um, and I don't think it's just the progressive interest groups. I also think it's really bringing business to the table and saying, you need to step up to the plate and help to imagine uh, these new realities. So can you give concrete examples? Of where this is already happening or where it needs to happen? Things we can do. Yeah, well, the one, I mean, the, one, the con most concrete example is, I mean, we need to be fighting for this big investment in clean energy. So, you know, and I mean, I think the interest, there's a lot of folks, there's so, so much more exciting stuff happening at the local level in some ways than in Washington, D.C., and sort of damnation through faint praise in some ways. Um, but I think that what, you know, and in our book we point out that there's been these wonderful visions laid out. One of my favorite books is Natural Capitalism, which is this vision of kind of a sustainability agenda. But what we haven't done is made it a contested political agenda. In other words, you know, like, we just lost, right now there was a big move by Michael Pollan and a number of other food activists to try to cut the subsidies to big ag, and they lost badly. I mean, like, we can, the Democrats control Congress, these guys are like friends with Boxer and Feinstein and Pelosi. Pelosi goes and asks for more money for big ag, and there's a political reason for that. They are scared of losing swing Democratic districts in the Midwest, which benefit from those big ag subsidies. So our point is that, 
it's so much harder to create a politics out of tearing down the old energy economy or the old agriculture, and it's so much more inspiring and empowering and politically uh, you know, feasible to go and invest and create the new clean energy and food economies. I mean, I would have loved to have, you know, the big, and I think the ag bill was something like 280 billion over the next five years. Why didn't we have a 280 billion dollar organic ag bill? You know, I mean, they got like two billion dollars for fruit and nut growers in California. We need to start contesting and, and really forcing this existential choice uh, on policymakers and the public. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member, on your example about solar energy and that for every increment of investment you get the cost drops accordingly, uh, if that's true, why isn't the private sector moving in and making the massive investment? Why do you need the government to the private sector not buy your argument? Is it a matter of scale? Is it a matter of capturing market share? What, what's going on there? Well, I mean, the truth is that it is happening. I mean, there's a big solar boom right now. Um, the problem is, is that it's just too slow. So by the time that solar is going to come down in price, I mean, estimating this is very tricky, but I mean, the, the, the solar optimists who I read that talk about when solar is going to become cost competitive with natural gas and coal, and I'm talking about in places like China, right? Because that's fine if we get it, but China is going to bring on like seven times our emissions over the next 50 years. That's something like 2040 or 2050. So we, don't, we can't wait that long. Um, we need to bring those clean energy uh, technologies down in price as quickly as possible. And that can, those, the size of those investments, I mean, I think that new VC money for solar this year was like, gosh, I mean, I think it was like 700 million or something like that. I mean, that's why you really need like, it needs to be something more like, you know, 20 billion a year. Which would, again, it's not like having one big factory in China, it's having like 500 of those big factories. So it's really a question of timing. Steve Katz, City Club. Um, I guess my question is, um, you're preaching to some degree to the uh, choir here. And um, I just returned from the East Coast where three pretty big uh, wind projects were just um, DC'd, basically. And so because of the NIMBY effect, so to speak, um, how would you deal with that? Well, thanks for asking that. Well, um, actually, in our book, we have a whole chapter called The Prejudice of Place. That is an argument against NIMBYism. And we open that chapter by talking about how Bobby Kennedy Jr., who's probably the, he was, he was probably the second most famous environmentalist in the United States right now, how he has led the opposition to a very important clean energy project that would be a wind farm in Cape Cod. And they've said, well, they've sort of made up all these kind of NIMBY reasons. It would be loud and ugly and garish. But in fact, you know, it's, um, wind, you know, wind farms, we point out, have become tourist attractions in Europe. Uh, this wind farm in particular is crucial because if you can get Cape Wind, then it'll, it'll, give, it'll give the green light to a lot, of, a lot of wind farms up and down the East Coast, and we'd love to see them on the West Coast as well. So we argue that we get our environmentalists get themselves in a kind of all twisted up around projects like that when you're sort of forced to support development, to be pro-development, and also to, to modify the landscape. And we point out that Cape Cod's a pretty developed place already. They talk about they don't want to spoil Cape Cod, but meanwhile they have like big oil tankers, you know, going across the, the Cape all the time to, so they can burn oil for their energy. Um, but that it's more than that. It's more like the question is no longer about kind of preserving nature. You know, nature is going to be changing all over the place thanks to global warming. Species are migrating to the poles. Um, it really radically changes the older conservationist agenda. And so, I don't know the secret to every, how to win every single NIMBY battle, but we've certainly put a lot of our attention. We did a fundraiser for Clean Power Now, and it was, it, just I'll say one last thing about it. We went into the Clean Power Now fundraiser uh, in uh, Boston after we spoke there, and we walk into the room, and everybody had this button on that said yes on it, and it had little windmills. And it was like, I just can't remember the last time I went to an environmental gathering where it had a button that said yes on it. Um, and, you know, we, on the back of our book, Richard Florida, the sociologist, 
uh, says, uh, you know, he kind of praises our book and he says, this is about a politics of yes. And I think that that really captures the spirit of that. If we're going to oppose coal-fired power plants, then we need to figure out what are we saying yes to. I'm sorry. We don't have time for any more questions. Michael, you've inspired us to be part of the solution. Thanks again. We're adjourned. <laughs>